Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we have an interview from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, the two legends themselves. They sat down for about 45 minutes in a CNBC interview, and they were asked about a variety of different topics. Now, I think the questions were interesting, but I think what was far more interesting was their take their actual answer to a number of these questions. For instance, Charlie Munger was asked about Jack Ma disappearing in China, and he gave a different take than what I thought about that. He is on a different side of that issue with Jack Ma disappearing. He also reiterated his view on Robin Hood, calling it a gambling parlor masquerading as a respectable brokerage, and that it's beneath contempt. So we're going to go into why he thinks that of Robin Hood and many other questions and many other things that were highlighted in this interview. And then another story I think is worth looking at is one of the most incredible engineering and maybe abuses of tax system. This is Peter Thiel, who used this completely legal way of turning the everyday middle class Roth IRA retirement account into a $5 billion tax-free piggy bank. That's right. He took the Roth IRA that you're only limited to $6,000 per year of deposits, and he turned that into over $5 billion that now he'll be able to withdraw when he turns 60 completely tax-free. And this outlines how he was able to do that. So in this episode, I'll be giving my thoughts on how he accomplished this and going into the details of it. So with that, we have a lot to jump into in this episode. Before we get into all of it, it always helps out if you like the video, the little thumbs up button that helps out the YouTube algorithm. Now, let's go ahead and before we jump into those news items with the Warren Buffett interview, let's go ahead and look at my portfolio. This is the passive income account. This is my personal portfolio. I share the value of it, the gains and the losses every single week. So on the thumbnail of every video in this channel is the value of this portfolio. And that goes up or down if the value of my portfolio goes up or down. I fund it almost every month. So I'm constantly putting money into this portfolio, trying to grow it. But if the market takes a huge dive, this number will go down. You can look at the videos around March of 2020 when we had coronavirus and, and that brought down the markets, the value went down and on the thumbnails, the value went down dramatically. So I show the progress of this portfolio every single week week by week. That's really one of the big things with this channel is if you want to follow along a real portfolio and see how things go over years of time, I'm going to continue to track this and build it as my primary investment portfolio. The goal of it is to grow a stream of passive income and every single company or ETF that I invest in helps accomplish that goal. So I have different income funds like the covered call ETF. I have different real estate holdings and I even have some tech companies that are long-term dividend payers like Microsoft and Apple. But every one of these companies pays dividends and all that money flows back into my account through the cash balance. This $158 came in just through dividends. If I look at different ways to track this, I have a spreadsheet that I offer to patron members that helps track the growth of this over time. For instance, it has a section that shows you your upcoming dividends. I can see that Nike is going to pay me $9 on the first of the month. So the first of next month, I'll be paid $9. Then we have T. Rowe Price on the 7th paying me $30. Then we have Vici. This is a new holding paying me $108 on the 8th of next month. Then we have Store Capital with $136. That's a REIT. That's a big dividend payer. Then we have Realty Income paying me $15. That's a monthly payer. And then we have MGP, MGM Growth Properties paying me $21. And this is all the ones that are officially declared right now. So this isn't projected income. This is really what I'm going to be paid over the next couple weeks. Now, one thing I have to mention about this style of investing, which is dividend growth investing, is not only has it been proven to give very good, stable, reliable returns with limited downside and lower volatility, but it's also an incredibly fun and addicting form of investing. It is an addicting form of investing. If I go to my activity feed and filter just by the dividends and see how much money is routinely, constantly flowing into my account, this is fun. If I look at Visa, they paid me on the first of the month $7.49. Thank you, Visa. Then we have Jeppy, the covered call ETF. They paid their monthly dividend of $110. Then we have Texas Roadhouse. They paid me $15. I can go and buy a meal at Texas Roadhouse with the money they just paid me. Then we have Johnson & Johnson. They paid me $14. Microsoft paid me their $34. Thank you for that, Microsoft. Then Target paid me $7. Next Era Energy, a utility company, paid me $8. Then we have Realty Income Corp. They paid me $15. That's a monthly dividend. Then we have some big ones. Home Depot paid me $52. That's enough that I can go browse around in Home Depot and buy some stuff. $52 is a lot of money. It's like having a gift card to Home Depot. And they pay me this four times a year. Then we have Dominion Energy. 
$41 for them. Then we have Schwab's dividend ETF SCHD. This one paid me $140. And then we have T. Rowe Price, which paid me $11. And keep in mind that this amount of dividends is just in the past month. This is the past 30 days. Next month, it will be the same thing. Another slew of companies, different companies that pay me dividends. And this goes on month after month after month. And in fact, this month, these amount of dividends is one of the lowest paying months of the year. So next month, it should be quite a bit more. Now, this type of investing, where I see the money appear in my cash balance without any type of interaction from me, it just continues to grow without me doing anything, is very addicting. It's a fun way to invest. It's completely passive. And I do think that dividend growth investing does have very good risk-adjusted returns. Some of the holdings I've been focusing on more recently are in the higher yielding category. I'm buying one real estate company called Vici. They own iconic, indistinguishable, very complex properties like the Venetian and Caesars Palace in Vegas. They collect rent from them every single quarter and they distribute that out to their shareholders, which is anyone that buys a stock. And then outside of Vici, the other holdings I've been adding to right now are SCHD, Schwab's US. US dividend equity ETF. I sold out of AT&T and added that $15,000 to this holding. So that's why I have SCHD. This one I think will do well over time. And then we have JP. JP Morgan's equity premium income fund. This one pays out a very high yield every single month by doing a covered call selling strategy. So, so these are two holdings that I think will increase my income through dividends dramatically. Those are the three holdings that I've been building up recently, Vici, Jeppy, and SCHD. And I'll continue to add to each of these over time. Now, if you wanna see my entire portfolio, there's a link in the description of this video that's updated. It allows you to click into any of these categories and see which companies I'm holding. So I'll put that link in the description for you. Now, moving on, we have an interview from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger talking about a variety of different subjects. And I think there's some interesting things to highlight from this. Charlie Munger is asked specifically about Jack Ma, the Chinese banking system, and his thoughts on that compared to the US system. I don't want the, all of the Chinese system, but I certainly would like to have the financial part of it in my own country. He actually says that he likes the Chinese system in terms of how they regulate their financial companies. And he thinks the way that we regulate our system in the US is way too lax. Although Ant Financial was bringing banking to a huge unbanked population before. I mean, there were things that they were doing that... I know, but you don't want a swinger to run. I the banks it. have the implicit guarantee of the government and you don't, you don't want to let any swinger run a bank. Now you can look up the definition of swinger and there's a couple different definitions, one of which I do not believe fits within the context that Charlie Munger is using here. It doesn't seem to fit the other one, being a lively, boisterous person that goes to lots of social events, I think is more appropriate with the way that he's using it. But interesting phrase for him to use, he goes on explaining why he doesn't want a swinger to be in charge of the banking system. Well, what about what they've done to Jack Ma? He's kind of disappeared as... Well, yes, but Jack Ma is one of the swingers. So they just cut his, they said, the hell with you. He basically got, gave a speech when he said to a, to a one party state, well, you guys are a bunch of jerks, don't know what you're doing and I know what I'm doing and I'm gonna do it better. And he was gonna wade into banking and no rules and just do whatever he pleased. He also but brought the banking Chinese, to a lot of- The Chinese communists people. did the right thing. They just called in Jack Ma and say, you aren't gonna do it, Sonny. Charlie Munger goes on to expound what he thinks is the problem in the US with the banking system. He terms it shadow banking, which is basically a term for fintech. People say, well, it's the unbanked. Well, the whole leverage buyout lending operation practically left the banks and went to shadow banks in our own country. He's right, and this is clearly what's going on right now. Banking is increasingly being done by non-banks. If we look at M1 Finance, for instance, M1 Finance is not a bank, it's a brokerage, but I can go to borrow and I'm eligible to borrow up to $97,900 at 2%. 2%. Compare that to JP Morgan or Bank of America or Citibank or Wells Fargo. None of them can compete with this, not even close. Even if you have a brokerage account with them, none of them can compete with this rate. Banking is being done by non-banks like M1 Finance, and frankly, they're doing it better. They have better, more convenient technology, it's easier to use, and even their rates, in many cases, is much more appealing than traditional banks. But Charlie's primary concern with all of this is the lack of regulation that exists with fintech companies. It hasn't caused any big trouble yet, but... I'll be amazed if it doesn't. Well, Jamie Dimon has said that, and like, look out for the some of the fintech areas that they're. Not yes, I agree with Jamie Dimon on that. I I don't think 
allowing all the swingers in the world to act as though they're banks is a good idea. Jamie Dimon has brought up this same concern many times, saying that banking's done by non-banks, they don't have to play by the same rules, they don't have the same regulations, and if this goes on for too long, all these unregulated fintech companies in the financial realm, he thinks it could cause systemic risk. Now on the subject of fintech, Charlie Munger is asked once again about Robinhood. Last time he spoke on this, he said that Robinhood is not good for civilization. He didn't say anything positive about it. In fact, he was heavily criticized as being elitist. Now, he's had some time, and maybe Charlie Munger has come around, updated his opinion on it, and changed his thoughts on Robinhood. So he's asked once again about this brokerage. Here's his response. Maybe we should talk about Robinhood and some of the areas well, that come up. Robinhood is beneath contempt. Okay, so it doesn't seem like his opinion on Robinhood has changed too much. Why? Well, it's a gambling parlor masquerading as a respectable business. It's well, of course you don't want to say you're a, it's a gambling parlor, but it is a gambling parlor. It's not encouraging people, encouraging people to buy a very, very, very low-cost index fund and hold it for 50 years. I will guarantee you that you will not walk in there get that advice. No. Instead, you'll get advice on how you can trade options, and, 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 and they'll tell you that... And it's not. telling people they aren't paying commissions when the commissions are simply disguised in the trading... It's basically a sleazy, disreputable operation. So Charlie Munger doesn't seem to care too much about the backlash he received last time he criticized Robin Hood. He's doubled down on it. He says it's a gambling parlor masquerading as a brokerage, a reputable brokerage, and it actively entices people into short-term strategies that make Robin Hood a lot of money, but they don't generate a lot of wealth for the people pursuing these strategies. So his opinion on Robin Hood hasn't really changed for the better. If anything, it's gotten worse. Now, moving on, we get to one of, I think, the most incredible parts of this interview. They talk about how they purchased a difficult business, a very difficult business, one that's more difficult to run than they anticipated. It was a mistake to purchase it, and they praised the people that sold it because they said it was smart of them to sell this business. But we could see, we soon realized it was about to lose money. Yeah, and so we, we, we sold the apartment store. It went out of business in 1983, but Hutzers, which was the silk stocking department store, they went out of business in, I don't know, 1985 or something. They're, they're gone. And the people there, quite understandably, wanted to build more branch stores, but you don't want to put more money into a, a business that's destined for failure. Now, we put $6 million of capital in that, and it was a dumb decision, everything. So they describe it as this difficult, declining business that's destined for failure, that the people that sold it were the smart ones. They made a mistake buying it, and now they need it out. So they sold the company at a loss, collecting $6 million, and here's what happened with that $6 million. That's $6 million. What would it be worth now, Charlie? It, uh, they got four-tenths of a share. A great many billions. Oh, it's tens of billions. Yeah. Now, if the department store had succeeded, we'd have a nice little business to <laughs> send us a little check. But because it failed, we've made 25. Well, we made more than $25 billion in that. It didn't look like it at the time, though. <laughs> had that business succeeded, their $6 million would have been wrapped up in that business and they would have had whatever profits that business generated. But since it failed and they had that $6 million to reinvest into different businesses, it ended up growing to well over $25 billion. So the failing of the business actually ended up to be a good thing, but at the time it didn't seem that way. This is one thing that I think is important to highlight from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger because when they have a failing business, they sell it. They don't hang on to a failing business just because it's buy and hold, diamond hands, never sell. If the business is failing, if it's declining, if it's destined for failure in the future, they sell it and look for better opportunities. Now, the last little thing that I'll highlight from this interview that I thought was interesting was that Charlie has fallen in love with Zoom. And this was brought up at the last part of the interview. She asks him why he likes Zoom so much. Charlie, I hear you're, you're pretty adept at Zoom. Oh, I fall in love with Zoom. How often do you talk to people on Zoom? At least three times a day. I made a deal in Australia. I, I think Zoom is here to assist. It just adds so much convenience. Now, Buffett does point out that Charlie Munger's in a little bit different of a situation than most people because he's 97 years old. So he's more reliant on video conferencing just because he's less mobile. He's not as mobile and agile as he used to be. Now, even though he's he's heaping praises on Zoom in particular, 
I don't think that's a reason to run out and buy stock in Zoom just because Charlie Munger likes it, because they do have a long list of competitors that are well-funded and ferociously competing with Zoom right now. You have Apple with FaceTime. They're making big changes that are mimicking Zoom. You have Microsoft with Teams. They're going to make that at the forefront of their new operating system. You, of course, have other companies like Slack. You have Google Meet, and you have lots of different alternatives to Zoom. So we'll see if Zoom can pass the test of time. Right now, they're basically competing directly with all the big tech companies. So that's some of the things that I thought were the most interesting from this interview. If you watched it and you found other things, let me know. Now, moving on, we have to jump into this article called The Lord of Roths. This is one part of a series of articles that have come forth that highlight how the rich and wealthy, people that have billions of dollars, are using very creative ways and loopholes to shield them from paying any taxes. In some case, they're making billions of dollars of real money, real realizable gains, and paying no taxes on that money. This is just one segment of it, one part of this overall series, and this one's called The Lord of Ross, and it highlights Peter Thiel. Now, if you're not familiar with Peter Thiel, he is one of, I think, the smartest people in the world. He's created a lot of companies like PayPal, to name one. That's a pretty decent company that he's founded. He's also started Palantir, another pretty cool company that you may have heard of if you've been on YouTube for more than five minutes. He started all sorts of creative, amazing companies. And even more so, he has a, a history of doing pretty incredible things to get things the way that he wants. For instance, years ago, it wasn't well known that Peter Thiel was gay because he wasn't ready to come out with that information. It was a secret, something that he wanted to keep private. Well, a website called Gawker outed him and they did it without his permission. They did it revealing a secret that was personal to him and Peter Thiel didn't appreciate that. So silently, he looked for ways to exact revenge on Gawker and he found an opportunity the case with Hulk Hogan and the explicit personal video that Gawker decided to reveal. Peter Thiel silently funded Hulk Hogan's case with the most expensive lawyers that money could buy. He bought Hulk Hogan the best lawyers and they destroyed Gawker. It's out of business because of Peter Thiel. Now, I think he did the world a great service in taking down Gawker personally, but that's aside from the point. The point is that Peter Thiel is probably a genius. He starts companies, very big, good companies, and he even destroys companies seemingly at will. He's not somebody that you would really want to mess with or want to insult because you don't know what he's able to do. Well, Thiel is also very public with his politics, and he's outwardly critical of our tax system. It says a founder of PayPal has publicly condemned, quote, confiscatory taxes. He's been a major funder of one of the most prominent anti-tax political action committees in the country, and he's bankrolled a group that promotes building floating nations that would impose no compulsory income taxes. So he's actually trying to create a new nation. The whole goal of the nation is that it won't tax you. No compulsory taxes. That's the level that he's going to because of his hatred of taxes is he's wanting to bankroll the creation of a new nation that won't tax him. Now, this article goes on to explain how he didn't necessarily need to create a new country in order to avoid paying taxes. It says, over the last 20 years, Thiel has quietly turned his Roth IRA a humdrum retirement vehicle intended to spur Americans to save for their golden years into a gargantuan tax-exempt piggy bank. So someone got a hold of these confidential IRS documents and they're sharing it now. They say using stock deals unavailable to most people, Teal has taken a retirement account worth less than $2,000 in 1999 and spun it into a $5 billion windfall. So when he turns 60, he'll have $5 billion completely untaxed. None of that wealth generated there is going to the government. That is absolutely incredible. Now, to put that in perspective, the average Roth IRA is 39,000. Peter Thiel's Roth IRA is 5 billion. So we have that little speck there. That is the average. Then you have Peter Thiel's Roth IRA. They give another comparison just to show how much money this is. They say that if every one of the 2.3 million people in Houston, Texas, were to deposit $2,000 into their bank account today, that still wouldn't equal this $5 billion. So newsflash, $5 billion is a lot of money. And Peter Thiel is going to have a lot of tax-free money available to him when he turns 60 years old. Now, how did all of this happen? How was Peter Thiel able to grow a Roth IRA with a limit of only $6,000 per year being able to be deposited into it to $5 billion? Well, it starts with the formation of PayPal way back in 2001. Someone named Tom Anderson, who was the Pence co-founder, worked with Peter Thiel and the other executives when they were setting up PayPal. If you really think this is going to be big, 
you know, you might want to consider this new Roth. You're not going to pay tax on it when you take it out. It's a no-brainer. The math was compelling. Teal wouldn't get a tax break up front, but he'd avoid an immense tax bill later on if the investment surged in value. They immediately grasped that, Anderson said, and they did it. So he was able to purchase a lot of PayPal right at the founding of it. They paid $0.001 per share. That's just a tenth of a penny. So he purchased with $1,700, $1,700, he purchased 1.7 million shares of PayPal. In hindsight, I think that was a pretty good deal. Now from there, he basically did the same thing over and over again to grow this Roth even more. It was upwards of $60 million in value in like 2011, and he used it to invest in other Silicon Valley startups, even ones that he founded again that weren't even private, so he could buy in at these bargain deals. Another company outside of PayPal is Palantir. This is another one that he helped found way back in 2003 that he was able to purchase a ton of shares. They're called founder shares before the company was even public. So of course it wasn't worth much when he put it in his Roth IRA, but now Palantir is a big public company worth tens of billions of dollars. So in both cases, he continued to buy these founder shares in different companies and hold them in his Roth IRA to let it grow into billions of dollars of untaxed money. Now in an interview, one of the authors of ProPublica comments on on the hacking of U.S. tax law by these billionaires. This is one of the questions that he's asked. Seems like U.S. tax law is getting hacked by the rich. In this case, we're talking about billionaires. And there's sort of this asymmetrical data thing going on where the billionaires can constantly adjust their approaches, their tactics to find these enormous loopholes. And yet Congress doesn't have even anonymized data to understand how the law is being exploited. I'm sure they're just as surprised as we are today that this is even happening because we've heard some of the response to uh, ProPublica's initial report. So isn't this sort of a structural problem where, you know, for especially the digital age, Congress has to change the way law is made. They need to be able to push out software updates to the IRS on a constant basis. They talk about billionaires hacking tax law. But one thing I want to point out is that in 1999, I don't think that Peter Thiel was a billionaire. I think he was a, a probably well-off founder of a company, but I don't think he had anywhere near the wealth that he has today. All of that happened after PayPal was a success. So this isn't like some already big billionaire found some loophole. This was somebody that put founder shares of a company that still had a lot of unknowns in his Roth IRA, and it turned out to be one of the biggest successes in Silicon Valley. Even companies like Palantir is an incredibly unique success. Most companies started in Silicon Valley fail, and Peter Thiel's PayPal could have been one of the unknown thousands of companies that failed, and he would not have billions of dollars in his Roth IRA if that was the case. The reason that he has billions of dollars in his Roth IRA is because the companies that he founded turned out to be successful. So that's my thoughts on this. I think it's gonna be very difficult for Congress or the IRS to update laws on this because everything that Peter Thiel did was a little bit of luck with his companies turning out well and just good planning. He put these companies in his Roth IRA decades ago, far before they were the big monstrous companies that we see today. But that's all for today. I hope you all enjoyed the show. I'll have another episode out soon, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I'll see you next time.